can, oh. you can use them. Okay. Okay. Um, maybe I just wasn't clicking hard enough. Um, so I don't have any disclosures or conflicts of interest. Conflicts of interest, other than the fact that I do run a blog about gut health, and I have a Patreon account to help support that. Um, we all know here that the gut microbiota is implicated in chronic disease. Uh, in many cases, this is just correlational or association studies. The, the gut microbiota seems to be altered in these various different chronic diseases. But in many cases, we've also got fecal transplant studies now into germ-free mice that have shown that some of these relationships are in fact causal, or at least partly causal. Um, some researchers have hypothesized that the loss of ancestral diversity is actually what's driving these chronic diseases. So some of you may have heard of Dr. Martin Blazer, who wrote the book, Missing Microbes. Uh, he's done a lot of research on this. And uh, essentially his theory suggests that the loss of particular ancestral microbes may impair the normal metabolic, cognitive, and immunological development of the host. So, and these changes are cumulative across generations and associated with increasing disease risk. So here on the right, you can see this, oh dear. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry about that. Um, so uh, here on the right, you can see that there's this progressive loss of diversity at, with increasing westernization, with the U.S. being here on the lowest, um, the lowest line here. So what is your axis? Um, so this is bacterial diversity, um, and this is, this is essentially an, an alpha rarefaction curve. So we're mostly looking at these final time points here to assess um, total diversity since the the diversity will essentially the number of species you identify will plateau as you sample more of the as you sequence more of the sample. So here you can see um, this is the Yanomami tribe, uh, the uh, Gushibo, Malawi, and then USA. And so this was with increasing westernization, we see this progressive loss of ancestral diversity in the microbiome. Um, so. By, by some estimates such as this, we've lost about 50% of our diversity. <coughs> and of course, there's a number of reasons for this. Um, perhaps the most obvious and well-known, perhaps, is the uh, overuse of antibiotics. Um, so these were no doubt one of the greatest discoveries of the 20th century, uh, but they are widely overused, devastate gut microbial communities, and recovery is often incomplete. Still struggling with this button. <laughs> Um, recent studies have also suggested that non-antibiotic medications can also alter the gut microbiome. In fact, uh, about 24% have a noticeable impact on gut microbial communities. How detrimental those changes are is, is not uh, well characterized yet, but at least 24% uh, are having a significant impact on the community composition. Could you give like, any particular examples of from that 24%? Uh, yeah, surprisingly, it was kind of all across different categories of, of pharmaceuticals. So it wasn't really like we would expect things like PPIs to have an effect, things like uh, immunosuppressants to have an effect. But it was much more widespread than that. Antidepressants, antihypertensives, um, pretty much within each category of drug, there were a number that did modify the gut microbiota. Um, and you can, ch you can check out this paper here. Um, for, for more details on that. I don't know what I'm supposed to be pointing at. Maybe that's the trouble. Um, another reason potentially for loss of diversity is the loss of seasonality in our eating patterns. Um, so this was a really interesting paper uh, published in 2017 in the journal Science on uh, the microbiome of Hadza hunter-gatherers. And uh, they found that the, the, they tracked their microbiota over um, the course of a year and a half, and they found that the uh, composition of the microbiota and its function reflected the seasonal availability of food and what they were eating. Um, so there were striking differences between the wet and the dry seasons, with many taxa dropping to undetectable levels during one season, only to flourish in the next season when the substrates that they were eating changed. Um, so, and what's interesting is the same microbes that were um, most likely to oscillate between the two seasons in the Hadza are completely absent in our industrialized populations. Um, so there's a number of other things I could talk about that are potentially leading to our loss of ancestral diversity, um, lack of time outside, 
just disconnection with nature, not being in the soil. Um, but I'm kind of going to focus more on uh, how we can how we can improve uh, our our gut ecosystem. And I think it's really important that we look at the gut as an ecosystem. So a few years ago, I went to a talk by uh, Dr. David Bowman from Stanford, who uses this analogy as of your gut as a rainforest. And so essentially, this is this is your healthy gut, and then this is your gut on antibiotics. Um, and so there's a couple key points here. Um, the first being the environment is really what determines which species can survive. And this is why we have a completely different microbiome on uh, our skin than we do in our guts um, or any other region of the body. Uh, it's because the, the environment and what's present uh, for the microbes as substrates really determines which species can survive. I'll come back to that idea a little bit more later. Um, we also can't just look at one or two species to determine the health of the ecosystem. Today, there's a lot of people getting excited about one bacteria or another and um, looking at their abundance on, on microbiome tests and saying, oh, I have an unhealthy microbiome, I have loads of phytobacteria. And they're not really uh, looking at the whole of the, the ecosystem. So it's really important to consider how microbes are interacting with each other and with the environment. And uh, another thing I want to stress is that there's no one healthy microbiome. Um, there's multiple stable states, multiple healthy microbiomes. Uh, and you know, just like there's not one healthy rainforest, right? So there's, there's going to be differences. Um, genetics, geography, um, diet are all going to have an impact on your unique microbiome. And we actually only share about one third of our microbes with our neighbors. Um, so another way to think about this is what's called a community stability landscape. And so in this, this, um, this circle here represents the gut ecosystem. Right, and, and uh, essentially this valley it's sitting in represents a stable state. So you can imagine that if it gets to a peak, it's gonna fall into another valley, which is another stable state. Um, so a perturbation like antibiotics could potentially uh, get you out of this stable state by overcoming this resilience you have to disturbance and, and potentially drop you into a disease state. Um, is that making sense to everybody? Um, so once we're in the disease state, the question is, how do we get back to that healthy state? And we kind of have to overcome that threshold um, to, to be able to get back into the healthy state. So of course, we can think about uh, lifestyle factors, um, our ancestral health principles. And for a good chunk of the population, if we do diet, exercise, sleep, circadian rhythms, um, perhaps a little bit of fasting, we can uh, essentially return the system back into that healthy state, maybe not the exact healthy state it was in before, um, but a much healthier state. Um, and we do know that these things have a major impact on the gut microbiota. So uh, dietary changes are known to rapidly shift the gut microbiota in less than 48 hours. Uh, this was a study done by David et al. and uh, published in Nature where they shifted people from a plant-based diet to an animal-based diet and then back again, and they showed rapid changes in uh, the gut microbiota composition here, they're showing beta diversity. Um, but in, in terms of another number of other measures, there were significant changes in terms of the bacteria that flourished and the bacteria that um, recessed into lower abundance. There were also alterations in microbial gene expression, which is not too surprising when you see such, such drastic changes in the composition. And of course, um, Bob covered this in his talk a little bit, but Dietary fiber is fermented into short-chain fatty acids, um, butyrate, acetate, and propionate being the most prevalent in, in most human guts. Um, I'm going to focus mostly on butyrate for this talk, um, because butyrate helps maintain gut barrier function. Um, so it increases mucus secretion, epithelial proliferation, and turnover, promotes release of antimicrobial peptides, which help to regulate the composition of the gut microbiota and also maintains physiologic hypoxia and gut homeostasis. And I'm going to um, come back to that idea uh, a lot more later in the talk. Um, I also want to point out, I guess Paul's not here, but any other carnivores in the audience, uh, before you start throwing things at me, ketones and isobutyrate can also make up for low butyrate. Um, isobutyrate is a metabolite of protein fermentation, and it can 
stimulate a lot of the same receptors as butyrate in the gut to exert those anti-inflammatory effects, those mucus protective effects. Um, and importantly, acetoacetate and beta-hydroxybutyrate, those ketone bodies produced um, during a high-fat, uh, low-carbohydrate low diet, um, can also potentially supplement these colonocyte energy pathways. And a lot of people don't uh, necessarily know this. Um, so here we can see, uh, this is kind of the typical pathway that we um, know is dietary fiber. We have um, those microbes that ferment dietary fiber into butyrate. Butyrate is then uptaken into the epithelial cell and then goes through its uh, metabolic pathway down to producing energy for replication. Of course, it also has signaling functions, um, which I mentioned, but this is the main way that butyrate provides 70% of the energy for colonic epithelial cells in the healthy gut in people who are primarily eating um, carbohydrates and fiber. Um, but in the, in, in the case of uh, gut inflammation, we actually might have either Either we don't produce enough butyrate um, because we don't have the butyrate producing bacterial populations to support the production of enough butyrate, or um, we have inflammation of the gut mucosa, in which case butyrate uptake might be uh, reduced, as has been shown in uh, inflammatory bowel disease, in which case it might be better or uh, ideal to be able to get some ketones into this pathway because they actually come right in. Butyrate is actually converted into essentially beta-hydroxybutyrate and acetoacetate before, used, before it's used for, um, for energy um, through beta-oxidation. So, uh, so ketones can potentially make up for, for low butyrate. And we'll come back to that idea as well. Um, research that I did as part of my uh, graduate dissertation work uh, also shows that exercise has independent effects on the composition and function of the gut microbiota. So in animal models, we've shown that exercise increases microbial diversity um, and butyrate producers, uh, generally increases short-chain fatty acid production and increases some of these uh, bacteria we think to be beneficial. Um, Cross-sectional studies have also looked at athletes versus non-athletes and looking at um, differences in diversity and composition there. And we see an increased uh, abundance of a number of key species uh, that we associate with health, um, decalibacterium pregnancy, uh, one of the keystone butyrate producers in the gut, and acromantia mucinophilia being a protective mucus uh, dwelling microbe. Um, but of course, we didn't know from that whether that's because athletes eat healthier or, um, or if it's a real effect of exercise. Um, so in 2017, we did the first um, longitudinal study of uh, exercise training on the gut microbiota and we found that especially in lean individuals, it did increase fecal butyrate and uh, the abundance of butyrate producers. Um, if you're interested more in the exercise microbiome connection, I have a number of blog articles on it. And I also wrote a, a review paper that covers all of these studies and a few more. Can you commercialize um, get a level of fecal butyrate? Sorry? Fecal butyrate, can you put that in patients or anything? Uh, can you no. test it, you mean? Yeah. So you, you can uh, test fecal butyrate. It is a, unfortunately, the best proxy measure we have for gut butyrate, but it's not perfect because it's basically a measure of how much butyrate you're excreting. So it doesn't tell you how much you're producing or absorbing. So it's a function of all of those things, which is why it's helpful to have animal models as well, where we can directly, more directly measure um, butyrate production. Uh, but you can, you can measure fecal butyrate. Uh, it is a complicated, methodologically, it's, it's complicated. So a lot of stool testing companies are doing it in a way that's probably not preserving the butyrate enough until it's measured. Um, so there, there are some issues with, with um, measuring that clinically, but could, could certainly be a, a one indicator in, in determining gut health. Um, so I wanna go back to this um, community stability landscape because uh, so if these diet lifestyles, diet and lifestyle strategies aren't enough, we might add some other interventions in. So this is kind of what we think of in functional integrated medicine, add in herbals, maybe we try some probiotics, prebiotics, or even go as drastic as FMT. Um, but the question is, uh, well, for another chunk of people, this is going to move them back into that healthy state. 
Um, but the question is, what happens uh, for the people where this doesn't this doesn't occur? Um, so, uh, quick note: um, if you're interested in more on those um, more basic strategies, um, I did cover them in my AHS talk, um, which you can find at this link here, um, and I'll be sure to share that after as well. Um, but I really want to focus on um, what happens to people who can't get over that hump with those strategies. Um, because we all know people like this, people who seem to have tried all those strategies and um, often have been working on their gut health for years, seeing practitioner after practitioner, and still stuck in a state of perpetual dysbiosis. And often they've done multiple rounds of antibiotics, herbals, uh, FMTs even, and are still having symptoms. This actually describes about 10% of the clients I work with. Um, so my major research questions, um, thinking of that, is how can we reverse severe gut dysbiosis in an individual once it has occurred? And how can we increase resiliency or prevent dysbiosis when faced with a disturbance? Once we're in that healthy state, how can we um, keep ourselves in that healthy state? And so to answer these questions, I want to first kind of cover what dysbiosis is and why it occurs. So gut dysbiosis is a pretty loosely defined term uh, that's thrown around, um, but it's generally refers to an altered state of the gut microbiota, usually associated with disease. Uh, and since everyone has a unique microbiome, there are virtually infinite states of gut dysbiosis, um, but there are some signatures that seem to be common um, among, across different diseases. And so uh, this, this uh, review is really excellent by Litbach et al. Um, they say perhaps the most consistent and robust ecological pattern observed during gut dysbiosis is an expansion of facultative anaerobic bacteria belonging to the phylum proteobacteria. Let me explain this uh, a little bit more um, in a second. Um, but essentially here you can see that there's, um, this is a healthy gut homeostasis state uh, where you have mostly, primarily obligate anaerobes, we would probably have about one to three uh, percent proteobacteria in there that's not shown, but um, predominantly obligate anaerobes, um, whereas here we have an expansion of proteobacteria, those facultative anaerobes. Um, we often see with that high proteobacteria, there's often a concomitant, concomitant reduction in the uh, butyrate producers. And again, we see this across a number of different diseases. These are just some that um, this pattern has been found. And uh, again, so the healthy microbiome is predominantly those obligate anaerobes. And uh, to remind anyone who's uh, maybe not familiar with this, these are microbes that can only grow and reproduce in an environment that is devoid of oxygen, or very, very low in oxygen. It includes many beneficial bacteria, including those that produce the short-chain fatty acid from butyrate from uh, dietary fiber. Um, then, of course, we have the facultative anaerobes, uh, and these are capable of growing in an environment with or without oxygen. Uh, it includes many opportunistic pathogens, mostly in the phylum proteobacteria. Um, you may recognize a number of the ones listed here. So these are, these are present in the normal healthy human gut at low, low abundance. But the problem becomes when they expand, um, as we'll see more going forward. Um, so a really fascinating body of research to come out of the labs of Dr. Andreas Baumler and Dr. Sebastian Winter uh, that I came across recently suggests that colonocyte metabolism and oxy oxygen leakage into the gut is what is actually driving the expansion of these facultative anaerobic bacteria and essentially causing dysbiosis. Um, so it really starts with a depletion of epithelial energy substrates which then results in oxygenation of the gut glucose. <coughs> and this results in a downregulation of um, a gene called uh, PPAR gamma and a shift towards an inflammatory colonocyte profile. So if you look at this figure on the right here, so this is a healthy colonocyte. We have uh, fiber being fermented by the microbiota into butyrate. Butyrate is then uptaken into the epithelial cell and it's activating um, this gene, PPAR gamma, which is kind of the control switch of metabolism. And when we have activated PPAR gamma, it's stimulating fatty acid oxidation through uh, beta oxidation in the mitochondria and beta oxidation of fatty acids like butyrate, actually. So it's stimulating basically its own oxidation, um, uses high amounts of oxygen. 
So we have oxygen diffusing in from the blood to the um, epithelium. Uh, and normally that oxygen is primarily used up in the cell um, through beta oxidation. And this keeps, this keeps the epithelial cells pretty happy and in a state of, of no inflammation. Um, but essentially what happens when we, when we either don't have um, that butyrate substrate or when we have some kind of other inflammatory uh, agent here that's causing inflammation, uh, essentially what happens is uh, there's no butyrate being uptaken, um, no activation of PPAR gamma. We're then getting um, oxygen here um, that should be being used for beta oxidation, but instead we're doing anaerobic glycolysis. So instead glucose, since, since there's no butyrate, they, essentially the epithelial cell is then starving. So it pulls glucose from the blood um, instead and does anaerobic glycolysis to lactate, lactate fermentation. And then uh, it's not using the oxygen that it should be for beta oxidation. So then that oxygen and lactate ends up getting very concentrated in the cell and it ends up kind of spewing out into the gut lumen. And this is where oxygen and lactate can really feed pathogenic bacteria. Um, I, know, I know I'm getting a little in the weeds here and I'm you know, at the risk of, of being in quadrant three and four, um, but I think, I think it's really, it's really uh, important to understand why this virus is occurring, especially for those people who the quadrant one interventions, regardless of, of how much they do them, they're really not, not seeing any improvement. Um, so uh, there's a number of things that can, can actually cause this shift um, from the healthy colonocyte to this um, kind of um, inflammatory profile. And uh, I'm gonna talk about each of them uh, a little bit uh, and highlight some of the studies that have, have shown this. Um, but it, it occurs with antibiotic exposure where you deplete the butyrate, pathogen invasion where you're causing significant mucosal inflammation, and potentially I'm, I'm theorizing a low fiber diet in the absence of ketones as well. Um, so the first is antibiotics, um, and essentially these uh, deplete gut butyrate, so they're, they're uh, leading to a, a loss of gut hypoxia. So in a normal healthy state, um, butyrate enters the epithelial cell, and in addition to stimulating um, that PPAR gamma pathway, it's also uh, increasing this hypoxia inducible factor, which is kind of like an oxygen sensor in the cell. And when that, when that oxygen sensor is activated to say we have, we have low oxygen, um, it coordinates gut barrier protection. Um, but when you knock out uh, mm -hmm. the microbes that produce butyrate with broad spectrum antibiotics, uh, it reduces butyrate levels by about fourfold and you get a rapid um, oxygenation of the mucosa, loss of hypoxia um, and impairment of gut barrier function. Um, this was not just due to lack of substrate, so they tried putting fiber in there, but the microbiota just after antibiotics had lost its ability to produce short-chain fatty acids from fiber. Um, interestingly, some pathogens can actually hack our gut metabolism, hack this pathway to promote gut dysbiosis so that they themselves can take over the niche in the gut. Um, so this is uh, research done with uh, Salmonella typhimurium, which is a common cause of food poisoning. Uh, it can invade the host mucosa and cause inflammation. And when it does this, um, again, we get that uh, host-derived oxygen and lactate leaking out into the gut lumen, um, selectively feeding uh, feeding it the substrates it actually wants to survive. So salmonella is causing inflammation and then basically causing the host to, to leak um, the substrates that it thrives on. Um, it also tends to, at the same time, deplete butyrate producing clostridia, both through um, direct competition and because uh, you're essentially uh, not getting that butyrate feedback loop. A second ago when oh. you said when you said that, um, that, that the microbiota lost its ability to produce, sorry, produce is there an indication that it's like because there are certain strains that are lost or it's just like ones that normally could produce uh, certain fatty acids is no longer occurring? Oh, it's definitely a loss of those those okay. species. Yeah, so they've looked in, um, in, the, in the mouse model, they, uh, clostridia is the main uh, butyrate producing uh, groups that were knocked out by these antibiotics, and that's what led to the reduction in butyrate. Yeah, 
So, so yeah, so the microbiotic composition essentially shifts when, when the antibiotics hit and there's no longer those butyrate producing microbes present. They will, you know, if you stop the antibiotics, they will recover over time. And then the gut microbiota would be able to produce short chain fatty acids again. But in the, uh, you know, acutely right after the antibiotics, those, those species are ablated. Right, so um, it's the distribution that changes, not the right. individual species' capacity to do Exactly, yeah. Um, right, um, so, so far we've seen two examples where butyrate depletion led to gut oxygenation and dysbiosis. Um, so given that the number one source of butyrate is from dietary fiber, um, unless we're in ketosis, perhaps. Um, I think it also follows that it's likely that low fiber intake out of the ketosis context um, would also lead to gut dysbiosis by the same mechanism. Uh, this remains to be shown in a controlled study, but there are a number of studies that have looked at uh, what a Western diet essentially does to the gut microbiota, and it tends to uh, increase proteobacteria. Um, so potentially one of the things that I hope to uh, study in the future is uh, this particular one. Um, so what's interesting is that all of these kind of have in common inflammation, right? Um, so uh, interestingly, a uh, study in 2007 showed that gut inflammation itself is actually enough to disrupt the gut microbiota and promote the growth of uh, proteobacteria. Um, so there's also a number of, of sources of inflammation that have been shown to, to increase proteobacteria in other studies, um, such as dietary emulsifiers, artificial sweeteners, psychosocial stress. Um, oops, sorry. Uh, and, and, so, and, and there's also potentially other you know, mediators of gut inflammation. So these are the ones that have been shown in, uh, have been published in studies, uh, but we can certainly imagine that other things that would inflame the gut, such as perhaps undiagnosed food sensitivities, um, lactose intolerance could also uh, potentially lead to inflammation and uh, promote gut dysbiosis through this mechanism by um, impairing colonocyte metabolism. You see, uh, patients often ask me whether stevia is a safe or artificial <laughs> sweetener. Any data? I don't think I've seen any on stevia and gut health um, in particular. I know that there's, there's a number of other studies on, on other artificial sweeteners that you know impair glucose tolerance because of how they affect the gut microbiota. So I'm kind of hesitant with stevia, but I haven't seen any evidence one way or the other. So they tell you to try an insulin response. I have patients who either do or don't get hypoglycemic mm -hmm. with stevia. Mm -hmm. The ones that do, I feel, are eliciting an insulin response and eventually ketosis health. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Are there emulsifiers that are more like carrageenan versus guardian? Is there any like a hierarchy of that or that there's all that? <laughs> I mean, so uh, I can't remember which particular one. I think um, it's polysorbate 80. I think it's polysorbate 80 and for this one. And methyl sodium were the two that they studied. Two, yeah. Yeah. Um, and you'll see some. You'll see something like modified cellulose or something like that on the package insert, and that's that's what it is. Yeah. But there's there's also been studies on sunflower lecithin and things on on negatively impacting gut health. Um, so, uh, um, great. So this is kind of the um, summary of those last few slides. Um, so essentially, what we have is is kind of we're stuck in this vicious cycle of gut inflammation leading to a loss of gut hypoxia, then feeding those facultative anaerobes, promoting gut dysbiosis, which then, you know, those um, proteobacteria are then inflammatory themselves and lead to more gut inflammation. So in this vicious cycle caused by a number of things, um, antibiotics, uh, pathogenic infection, low fiber diet, or other inflammatory agents. We can interrupt you for a Yeah. <laughs> One of the things I was doing a presentation on the gut microbiome and the risk of dementia. And one of the things that I saw, and I think it was in Perlmutter's work, is that if a young person has antibiotics, they return to their natural diversity so much more quickly and reliably than an older person does. And do you think it's just the accumulation of all these things? 
or is there a particular mm -hmm. aspect of an aging that, that is well makes it vulnerable? Yeah, that's really interesting. I I would think that it's it's probably that an older gut is a little bit more susceptible to being is is a little less resilient. So if you think about that community stability landscape, that uh, that older gut is going to be just less back, less resilient to disturbance, <laughs> right? Um, so studies have shown that the the gut microbiota does become more inflammatory with aging, and that the gut barrier gut barrier function does decline. Now whether that's a normal function of aging, I don't. You know, uh, you know, kind of relevant to what we were talking about yesterday, um, or whether you know that's more pathological aging. Um, that definitely seems to be what occurs. And if your if your gut barrier function is not are you know already optimal, then something that triggers inflammation is probably going to have a more dramatic effect than than it would in a young, healthy person. Um, great. So. Uh, I want to get back to those research questions. Um, how can we reverse gut dysbiosis in an, in an individual once it has occurred, once they're in that vicious cycle? Um, and, and fortunately, we do have some keys um, from the, the studies uh, that I presented. Um, so I just want to kind of go back to um, PFAR gamma and, and remind everyone that this is really the, the control switch for clonocyte metabolism. So I showed before those two different clonocytes, the healthy and the disease, but we can also kind of think of this as a spectrum of, you know, epithelial energy starvation um, over here, where we're not getting enough butyrate, um, PPAR gamma activation is reduced, lower beta oxidation, um, and reduced hypoxia. So we're going to have more oxygen leaking into the gut, dysbiosis, and inflammation. Over here, if you have um, plenty of fuel, energy substrates for the gut, um, butyrate, ketones, etc. You're going to upregulate that PFAR gamma, um, increase beta oxidation of fatty acids, and hypoxia leading to gut homeostasis. Um, so the question is, um, could actually stimulating this pathway prevent or reverse gut dysbiosis? Is there any evidence for that? And in fact, um, there's quite a bit. Uh, in inflammatory bowel disease, um, rosalidazone is a PFAR gamma agonist. It's been shown to prevent dysbiosis and reduce colitis symptoms in animal models. Uh, it's a pretty, uh, pretty gnarly PPAR gamma agonist, so it does have a lot of uh, other side effects and is typically uh, not used much in, in humans, especially for inflammatory bowel disease. Um, so now the first line drug treatment is mesalamine, um, which has a little bit more of a targeted effect in the gut. And uh, the anti-inflammatory effects have been shown to actually be mediated through PPAR gamma. Um, and people who are on, go on mesalamine, uh, end up with a reduction in proteobacteria and increased abundance of bacterial, which is that keystone uh, butyrate producer. Um, interestingly, butyrate supplementation itself for two months uh, was also shown to increase abundance of butyrate producing bacteria in uh, a randomized control trial of IBD patients. Um, so it's interesting because we can actually almost think of butyrate as a prebiotic because it's, you know, indirectly it is leading to um, increased abundance of, of butyrate producing bacteria. Do you believe that somehow is due to the fact that uh, uh, a quadrant three force line yeah. uh, it somehow decreases oxygen uh, uh, into the into the gut. Do you believe that's the pathway? Yeah, I, I think so essentially if you're providing extra substrate, right? Um, so in inflammatory bowel disease you're essentially having low-grade energy starvation, right? You're having, basically you have reduced PFAR gamma expression in inflammatory bowel disease, so you're, you're, you're increasing, you know, the inflammatory colonocyte pathway. Um, so if we provide supplemental butyrate, um, it can essentially uh, shift back towards that healthy state. Higher PFAR gamma activation, you're getting beta oxidation of that butyrate, you're promoting the healthy, healthy environment. Um, Rosy glutathione? Is that, I mean, is Rosy glutathione the TGP, the Avandia? I might. I'm, okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. I'm, <laughs> I've, I've only read it in papers. I've never, never said it aloud before. So. <laughs> you know, it's great. It's great. You don't have to get Right. Rosy glutathione came out first. Yes. Yeah. Avandia. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
so, and, and this hasn't just been shown in inflammatory bowel disease. Um, there's also uh, in models of diet-induced obesity. Um, they've interestingly found that there's this uh, synthetic version of two compounds that are found in a traditional Chinese medicine formula. Um, I'm going to say DBZ, so I don't have to pronounce that. Um, it activates PPAR gamma to a lesser extent than rosiglitazone, and uh, is still able to protect against gut dysbiosis, barrier dysfunction, and body weight gain in, in that mouse model. And now a drug company can sell. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the, the DBZ is a synthetic version. Of the medicine? Is that what you're saying? Correct. Medicine. So, yeah, so they took two compounds that are found in this Chinese you medicine know, formula. Two compounds. Uh, yeah, it's it's a borneol ester, and uh, I, I think Dan Shenzu is one of them, and, and Bing Pian um, is the other. So, the, the Chinese medicine formula is called Fu Fang Dan, Fu Fang Dan Shen, I believe. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm, I mean, I honestly, I'm curious why they didn't just use the, the formula itself. Um, it may, it may be so that they can, they can, uh, market it better. Um, but I'm excited to see more, um, more studies on how herbal compounds could potentially, um, activate this pathway and be particularly helpful. Um, so actually, I, I kind of did a, a review of, of the literature and looked for any strategies that could potentially target this pathway and support gut hypoxia. Um, and, and some of these are in that quadrant one. Um, so we've got, you know, um, diet, exercise, fasting, and caloric restriction. Um, I, I guess, oops, I'm letting again. Um, uh, like I said, supplementing with butyrate, I touched on the salamine and the DBZ compound. Um, stress management is also um, important. Uh, stress has been shown to reduce that PPAR gamma activation. And then a number of these um, herbal compounds and nutrients, probiotics and prebiotics, could potentially um, target this pathway and support gut hypoxia. Again, this is kind of um, really focusing on those people that those basic diet lifestyle strategies aren't working. Um, maybe we could use some of these strategies to kind of tip them back into that healthy, um, uh, that healthy state and then be able to go back to maintaining that healthy state and increasing resilience with diet, exercise, um, stress management, et cetera. I've seen one study of the drug was on Prizor, inulin in healthy people. That's your worst blood glucose control with the prebiotic. Interesting. I'm wondering if you have like thoughts on where like those isolated prebiotic fibers are useful or not? Yeah, I generally don't use them. I think, especially especially in people with inflamed guts, it just tends to increase inflammation. Uh, and I, it's just not something we would ever find, right, is, is an isolated fiber in its concentrated form. Um, you know, some, some people do try them and they, they tend to see benefits from them. Um, but I, I typically shy away from doing isolated fiber. I mean, the same thing for, instead of oligosaccharides, you can see some kind of something to do. Of what? Sorry? The FOS for oligosaccharides, right? Yeah. Out of an isolated oh, definitely. Product. Definitely. There's a real problem. Where does aloe vera fit in with good texture of Um, I haven't seen anything that, I didn't find anything about aloe vera and, and this particular pathway. That doesn't mean it's not helpful to the gut. Um, but this is kind of focusing on things that can really shift back towards that gut hypoxia and um, stop feeding uh, facultative anaerobes. No studies um, on specific foods. Sorry? No studies on specific <laughs> No studies on specific foods. Like bilberries. <laughs> <laughs> no, but maybe I'll do them as part of my postdoc. So if hopefully. I go to your blog on that reference there, can I find a study on Barogast. Yeah, definitely. Um, so in, in terms of with their barogast, it wasn't a study that actually looked at a barogast itself, but a lot of the components of a barogast, the herbs that are in it, are known to activate PPAR gamma. And actually, surprisingly, almost all of them do. Um, so I don't know if that was at all relevant in how they chose to formulate that. Um, but, you know, a barogast has been clinically shown to improve um, symptoms and functional bowel disorders. So. Um, it was really interesting that it, it has so many herbs that do um, affect this pathway. 
so I'm, I'm really interested in, in, in exploring some of these um, in my future research. Um, Interesting. Um, interesting. I, I haven't seen anything with, uh, with that one. I think it has been used in some of the animal models to show um, to show that PFAR gamma was implicated in the pathways, um, but I haven't seen any um, human studies on how it affects um, really gut metabolism. Those were huge that I used drugs uh, yeah. years ago. I used tons of those, you know, and I never really noticed any uh, influence on the gut, but you know, maybe humans were nasty. Yeah, you know? interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's interesting. Um, I mean, I think I think periodic fasting and exercise are probably you know probably the lowest hanging fruit, right? Going to have the biggest uh, impact on this without potential side effects. So I would never recommend that anyone who's got a healthy gut, you know, go go be taking mesalamine to try and um, you know make their gut more resilient. I don't. You know, it's it's still still a pharmaceutical has side effects. Um, I, I will talk a little bit more about you know if you think that um, if you're going to be taking antibiotics, actually doing some of these might be really beneficial to prevent antibiotic induced dysbiosis. And we'll kind of get to that in a minute. Um, uh, so I also wanted to um, make a quick note about. The importance of mitochondrial health in this because uh, you know even if you've got all the substrates if you don't have healthy mitochondria to do the beta oxidation you're going to be shifting to that inflammatory profile um, so it's really important that we support mitochondrial health and uh, mitochondrial pathology has been found in a lot of different uh, gut disorders especially inflammatory bowel disease um, they're essential to that butyric metabolism uh, to maintain gut hypoxia uh, PFAR gamma activation itself actually supports the formation of new mitochondria and kind of um, supports their function as well. Um, but it's possible that if someone is struggling with their gut health, then supporting mitochondrial function um, with uh, some of these additions might be helpful. Um, obviously, this is, again, after doing all the diet and lifestyle things to optimize mitochondrial health. Um, so I'm really interested in how we can kind of combine some of these things to create integrative synergistic approaches to break that cycle and create essentially enough of a disturbance to shift back to that healthy, um, healthy gut ecosystem. Um, so interestingly, some studies have found that mesalamine combined with curcumin or butyrate is more effective than mesalamine alone for IBD. So this is one example where um, they've shown synergy not a lot of other studies are, are looking at, at synergy of these uh, different components, um, but I'm really interested in, in how we could try integrative approaches. So for example, we might imagine using mesalamine, curcumin, some other things to activate PPAR gamma. We could provide butyrate and ketones to support epithelial energy, and then perhaps something like L-carnitine to make sure that those energy substrates are actually getting into the mitochondria to be metabolized. So this is kind of like a kitchen sink approach, but you know, when you have um, patients that have really tried everything, um, perhaps this is something that could actually um, move the needle and, and provide enough to shift back. Yeah. Have you looked at like exogenous ketones? Or I would love to look at that. And that's actually, I'm, I'm hoping that I can um, especially look at uh, ketones and how they affect this pathway. Um, actually, there are so few studies on how ketones affect gut barrier function. Like not, it, it, makes, it makes complete logical sense that ketones can feed in and provide epithelial energy substrate, feed into the butyrate pathway and promote epithelial proliferation. But there's very few studies to show that ketones can actually support gut health. Um, we can get from Dagestino or Korea Spops to send you the S and they give you the, the ketone esters. Yeah, there. yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> Um, MCP oil, did you? Sorry? MCP oil, did you? 
uh, perhaps, but maybe not as well tolerated by someone who's already got the gut issues. So it just depends on how, uh, how tolerated. Um, so I'm currently uh, trialing some of these protocols with uh, my clients. They're working very closely with their gastroenterologists um, since there are some of these uh, more potent PPAR gamma agonists being used here. Um, so hopefully I'll have more to report back in, in a year once I've been able to uh, look into this even more and, and try it out with, with people. Um, so you give them the solutions that actually work and the gastroenterologist prescribe the PPI. Well, they'll prescribe them the salami. Right, they prescribe them salami. They've done a little bit. Everybody gets a PPI, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I also, you know, what about dysbiosis of the small intestine? So, so far I've mainly been talking about uh, the colon and the metabolic switch that happens in the colon. Um, but does this actually happen in the small intestine? Um, and this is important because we know that small intestinal dysbiosis rather than SIBO actually underlies a great deal of gut symptoms. So for anyone who's not familiar, um, this paper came out, I think it was last summer, um, that suggests that a lot of our SIBO knowledge is really misguided and that more often than not, it's not bacterial overgrowth, it's actually just dysbiosis, so a shift, um, and often um, increased proteobacteria, interestingly, um, which, is, which is causing a lot of the gut symptoms we think are associated with SIBO, like bloating, abdominal pain, et cetera. Um, I mean, oftentimes, globally, clinically, we're like, you mean the same thing. Oh, definitely, definitely. But in the, in the research world, unfortunately, there's been a real focus on the overgrowth, and a lot of the studies have been defined based on the diagnosis of the number of CFU per mil in cultured aspirates, which is just right. completely outdated. Um, you know, because you know what grows really well in culture? Pretty bacteria. Yeah. Um, so, so really what they've been seeing is people who have high proteobacteria, they don't necessarily have more bacteria in their small intestine, but they have more proteobacteria. They're gonna be diagnosed with SIBO because that proteobacteria is gonna grow really well in the culture. And they're going to think that they have an overgrowth because um, there's a higher, you know, higher CFU per mil um, count than than they would otherwise. Um, so I agree with you. A lot of a lot of practitioners are using them um, synonymously, but at least in the in the research world, there's been a lot of confusion over the fact that you know it's overgrowth, and also a lot of um, people thinking that because it's overgrowth, they need to kill, you know, it's kill the overgrowth as opposed as opposed to um, you know, try to modulate the ecosystem and shift it back to healthy. Um, so, um, can this actually affect the small intestine? Um, there's definitely lower PPAR gamma expression in general in the small intestine than the large intestine, and a slightly higher oxygen concentration as well um, as you move up. But um, I did was able to find um, one study was actually published in PNAS um, where they gave a you know they call it a high fat diet course, don't, don't uh, give any details there, but that's whenever you see high fat diet in a mouse study, you can pretty much assume it's a Western high fat, high sugar, low fiber diet. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, so they did find that um, this, uh, this Western diet downregulated PPAR gamma in the small intestine almost twofold, leading to reduced antimicrobial gene expression, um, which is what regulates the gut microbiota, especially the small intestine. Um, and caused gut dysbiosis of the, of the small intestine, which was uh, reversed by rosiglitazone. Um, so that was really interesting, and I'm really, really interested to think more about how, um, how this could be implicating, um, how this could be implicated in, in the small intestine. Um, so thinking about that a little bit more, um, butyrate is the major fuel for epithelial cells in the large intestine, but glutamine is the primary fuel in the, in the small intestine. And it activates PPAR gamma in the small intestine, much like butyrate does in the colon. Um, so um, could we provide glutamine um, to people who are having a small intestinal dysbiosis and potentially help overcome that epithelial energy starvation? Um, there's also a question of whether we could use certain mesalamine formulations for IBS. Um, most studies have found fairly low efficacy. Um, it's been kind of mixed. 
Um, but those were mostly using lower doses. Recent study using a higher dose, um, which is closer to what's used in inflammatory bowel disease, um, for 12 weeks had significant benefit in IBSD patients. And I also wonder, um, it's definitely going to be individual because IBS is a, is a very heterogeneous condition, but it's possible that, um, you know, going back to that integrative approach, synergy, um, maybe we could combine the salamine or that DBZ compound with glutamine and ketones to really um, provide that support for the small intestine. So that's really going back to, as opposed to trying to modulate the gut ecosystem or kill bacterial overgrowth, perhaps we just need to support the environment, um, you know, from that e ecological perspective, support the environment and it will select for the microbes that we want. So, um, sorry, they, uh, you had ketones on there also, but mm -hmm. you're saying do the same thing as substitute as glutamine or for the small intestine? As well, correct, or? correct. So, I, um, I believe I found one study that, have, that suggests that ketones can feed the small intestinal epithelial cells. Um, whether it, whether it can it, um, increase PPAR gamma there, right. I'm not as sure. Ketones generally increase PPAR gamma across multiple body tissues. Um, so it, it, some of this is, is more speculative, especially for the, for the small intestine. Um, but it, it really doesn't make sense, you know, if we went through periods of fasting that our cells wouldn't be able to use, um, ketones in the small intestine as well. Um, uh, so I'm going to summarize, um, that part there, and then I have just a little bit more on, um, resilience. Um, so the first is we need to think of the gut as an ecosystem importance of the environment in determining species abundance rather than directly just trying to modulate the gut environment. Um, and I think we have been doing this to a great extent in terms of trying to do things that support gut barrier function, but perhaps we need to be thinking about um, the hypoxia piece as well. Um, high proteobacteria, low butyric producers is a signature of gut dysbiosis. And when you see this, it indicates, slightly indicates that you've got that underlying epithelial metabolic dysfunction and inflammation. Um, antibiotics, gut infections, or low fiber intake without ketones can all deplete gut butyrate and lead to this vicious cycle. Um, this understanding of how oxygen drives gut dysbiosis offers important insight on how we might be able to reverse it. I'm hoping that I'll be able to do my um, postdoc research in this area as well. Um, and uh, if, if basic gut health interventions fail, um, targeting PPAR gamma pathway may be able to um, help us get back to that healthy state um, using integrative synergistic approaches. Um, and then, of course, we can hopefully still, um, still maintaining those ancestral health principles and, and being able to use those to um, maintain and promote health and resilience. Um, so I'm going to briefly touch on the second research question, which is how can we increase resiliency or prevent dysbiosis when uh, faced with a disturbance? Um, so, of course, antibiotics are perhaps the most significant disturbance um, that, that we know today. Um, sometimes unavoidable, sometimes you get bit by a snake in Costa Rica, right? It will not be, right? Okay. Yeah. It will be on sponsors. Well. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. Probably, probably yeah. still has an effect on the gut. Antibiotic, whether, it whether it goes across the gut, I think it might. It's not antibiotic, it's not antibiotic dependent. Good perhaps. Better, good job. Perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> I guess. I wasn't in a position to right. use that. <laughs> no, that would not. That would not. I mean, <laughs> um, yeah, so <laughs> sometimes antibiotics are unavoidable, um, but they can cause a loss of diversity and potentially increase risk of chronic disease, especially if we get them during early life where it's a critical period for the maturation of the gut microbiota. And uh, antibiotic exposure has been shown to increase risk of asthma, obesity, autoimmune disease, skin conditions. I could probably list a whole bunch more here as well. Um, so the question is, what, what do we do if we have to take antibiotics? And so most people ask, well, can't we just take probiotics to support recovery? Um, but recent evidence suggests that probiotics taken after antibiotics may actually return the, delay the return of the native microbiome. Um, this included a lot of the butyrate producers, which was really notable. So essentially, they, they um, gave people lactobacillus and bifidobacterium-based probiotic after the antibiotics, and it delayed the return 
of the native microbiota, including the butyrate producers, for about three months. Um, this was compared to the spontaneous recovery group, which recovered in 21 days, mostly. Obviously, um, there's, there's still some degree of incomplete recovery, um, typically, with antibiotics. I, I would just like to point yeah. out, that this is an example where like, good, good evolutionary reasoning, got, like, that's, that would be a good, like, that was a first guess, like, okay, you take antibiotics and you treat the fish with, uh, with uh, probiotics, but it actually needs real study to like, follow up, is that, is that, is, is that hunch? Yeah. Um, yeah. So if anyone's interested in that, they can read more um, in this blog article that I wrote about that um, that study, or or here's the uh, link to the study in um, in original form. Um, it's possible. Again, they use lactobacillus and bifidobacterium probiotics. So it's possible that Escolardi. Uh, or other probiotic formulations may be less detrimental or su actually support recovery, um, but it's still unknown. Uh, so I'm, I'm quite hesitant about, about recommending probiotics every antibiotics now, especially since they're, they're delaying the return of those butyrate producing microbes and probably stressing the gut epithelium more. Which things like the, the various fermented foods fall somewhere like yeah, that's a great that's a great question. I, I don't think we know. It probably probably could have a similar effect in delaying return if they're if the microbes in the fermented foods are kind of filling up the niche so much that the butyrate producers can't return. Um, then it's possible that that could be detrimental as well. Yeah. Is this just one study or is multiple? This is this is just one study. Um, it was uh, was shown at multiple levels. So they, sorry, um, they showed it. Uh, they did this in, in mice, humans, and they also then looked at what components of the probiotics in, in culture were inhibiting. And it was primarily the lactobacillus that seemed to be producing things that inhibited the growth of, of butyrate producing bacteria. So I'm, I'm hesitant to say, you know, this is, this is definitive, um, you know, because like I said, it's possible that other probiotic formulations may have, have better effects. So, um, yeah, but I do think, um, Fortunately, we do have a, a better, more evidence-based approach, I believe, um, which is instead to take supplemental butyrate during and after antibiotics to support gut hypoxia. And so um, one of the studies that I, um, or going off of one of the studies that I mentioned earlier, um, uh, taking butyrate during and after antibiotics might prevent that colonocyte energy starvation and attenuate dysbiosis. And in fact, um, they showed in that antibiotic study that I mentioned earlier that if you supplement the mice with tributyrin, which is a, a um, basically a triglyceride form of butyrate that's targeted to the colon, um, or tends to be released more in the colon, uh, it restored epithelial hypoxia in antibiotic treated mice and reduced the fitness and advantage of salmonella um, in the gut after antibiotics. So I'm really interested to kind of piggyback off this study. I really want to do one where we, sh we can um, give butyrate and see if it can, pr can uh, prevent the entire, uh, the entire effect of antibiotics on gut composition, you know, because this, this really only looked at salmonella and how that responded and looked at hypoxia. Um, but if we look at the actual gut composition, can taking supplemental butyrate to support this pathway prevent um, the whole spectrum of antibiotic-induced dysbiosis. Can you take your rainforest analogy and do the same thing here and say like, well, assuming if we, you know, cut down everything, burn it off, well, what happens? Do we introduce one certain type of plant in which and now that's right. every rain in the place? Yeah. Or do we want to like you know, put more nutrients in the soil or I love that. Fresh, so, yeah. Absolutely. So the rate can be provided. Yeah, so you can you can actually buy tributyrin. Um, you can also, uh, there's other formulations of butyrate that are more targeted to the colon, so probutyrate is one. I have no affiliation with them, but um, probutyrate is essentially in a fiber matrix, so it makes it to the colon and um, disperses there, um, whereas tributyrin is in a triglyceride type form. Um, so both of those are commercially available, and you could take them during and after antibiotics. It's also possible that ketones, whether exogenous or maybe you just fats, if you have to take antibiotics, and that could potentially support um, support gut hypoxia um, by upregulating your your ketone production. Um, so I'm really interested in, in exploring some of these other 
avenues to, to be able to prevent antibiotic-induced dysbiosis. Um, but perhaps uh, even better would be stool banking and autologous FMT. Um, so interestingly, this, this study actually had not just those two arms where they had probiotics or spontaneous recovery, but they also did a group where they had, where they did autologous FMT. So what they did is they had people before taking antibiotics bank, uh, stool, do a stool sample and store it. And then the day after they finished the antibiotics, gave them a fecal transplant of their own stool um, to re-inoculate their uh, gut. And they found that this autologous FMT restored the entire composition of the gut microbiome in less than a single day after antibiotics, even down to the mucosal level. Um, so this, this, this study included um, looking at the lumen, looking at the mucosa, and biopsies. Um, so this was really amazing and has incredible potential to prevent loss of diversity and the associated increased risk of chronic disease. Again, on the rainforest analogy, but well, let's take a little sample of all the plants that are here now. <laughs> Replant them, whereas once we burn it all down, and we I'm, I'm going to do that for my presentation next time. Um, Thanks. <laughs> um, oh, it does. It definitely does. <laughs> it definitely does. Yeah. It definitely does. I, yeah. Taking antibiotics for some other, and there's like yeah. yeah. right. But yeah. so that yeah. actually brings me to my my, my next point, which is. Um, how can, how can we make this a standard of care to re-inoculate people with their own personal microbiome right after antibiotics and prevent increased risk of chronic disease? Um, so this is actually a project Stephen and I have been working on a little bit for the last um, probably about six months. Um, it's called My Gut Bank. It's a citizen science project and personalized stool bank. So the idea is that we have um, people submit their samples. Um, we essentially store them at minus 80 degrees Celsius in prep prepared for fecal transplant. Um, and then if you have to take antibiotics, obviously personalized fecal transplant, not FDA approved currently, but the idea is that perhaps we could match individuals who want to store their stool samples and preserve their gut health into clinical trials to demonstrate the safety and efficacy of stool banking um, to prevent chronic disease. Well, when, um, the, when the FDA said that stool was a drug, mm -hmm. they said the only time you can do fecal transplant is if you have two antibiotic treatments for C. diff. Right. So how are you going to get around that? Well, how that's convince the, the FDA <laughs> that they have to expand their indications for FMT. Go to the Bahamas. Yeah, go I mean, I'm, I'm not saying it's easy, and, and that's why it would have to be done current, like it would currently have to be done in a research setting. Um, but, uh, you know, personalized FMT, Right now, the, the FDA does not distinguish between regular FMT and personalized FMT. But if you think about it, personalized FMT, you're only re-inoculating with stuff that you've seen before, right? So even if, our, even if our screening techniques are missing things, you're not putting anything in that your body, you know, that wasn't there before. So um, the, the hope is that perhaps, you know, we can make that distinction. And I'm, I'm really interested in basically starting a discussion more about this is because I think this needs to happen um, you know, to prevent chronic disease, especially you think about all the kids who are getting antibiotics at age one, two, three, four. My mom sent me my re medical records the other day from age zero to four, and I had six antibiotics in that time. And that definitely did not help me with my, you know, chronic eczema growing up. Um, so I'm really interested in how we can, how we can leverage this to, to make this a standard of care. Because in the future, I mean, there's really no reason why we shouldn't be able to say, okay, you're going in for scheduled surgery, Right? We know you're going to get antibiotics. Um, why not bank your stool beforehand and give you a re-inoculation afterwards? Um, so I'd, I'd love to hear you. 